thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so in, in my talk, I'm going to tell you about a tool that we developed at ETH Zurich, which uh, is concerned with test automation. And uh, um, it's concerned with test automation to a degree where the developer only presses uh, a button, and the testing happens completely automated in the background. My talk is structured uh, as the following. Uh, already, as the talks that we have heard so far make clear, many people understand different things when it comes to testing. So in the first part, I'm going to talk uh, about what I mean when I talk about test automation. And uh, I'm going to describe the core work that the auditor's framework does. And then I'm going to show you uh, the components, the main components that the auditor's framework is built up with. There's going to be the core components here with the oracle that tells you when a test case passed and when a test case failed. There is the actual testing strategies that come up with the input data and the, the test cases that exercise your system and your test. But then, and this is where I also want to put an emphasis, uh, once you experiment with, with uh, a few strategies, it becomes important that you have good support components that, that uh, glue your framework together. And we've learned quite a few lessons there. Um, and I want to share this experience with you. In the end, you'll see a demo, a live demo of the tool, and I'll show you some experimental results that we've gathered. So let's start with test automation. Um, one of the, or maybe the most important uh, things to, to do when, when you test is to automate the actual test ex execution, because it's a cumbersome work and nobody likes to do it. Um, especially with the advent of the X unit kind of tools, this, this has been something that people started to do. To do. Uh, it was uh, less overhead. It was a simple tool. Everybody uh, really likes it, I, I, I think. But it's only one part of, uh, of the test automation. You're still concerned with test case creation or input data creation. And then once you run the test case, you need to decide whether what just happened revealed the bug or it didn't reveal a bug. And, uh, uh, many, many people, many bright people have done uh, very good research in these areas recently. There have been innovative ideas being used. People have been using specification uh, or, or contracts to both automate, automatically filter invalid input. So if they come up with a random input to say what is not valid and what, what is valid, and they've used specification to, to rule out um, uh, or to reveal whether an executed test case contains bugs. I will talk more about this uh, later. Um, of course, this uh, requires the presence of contracts in your source code, but then again, other people have come up with ideas to dynamically infer a specification in the case where a specification is not present. People have been using a variety of technologies like symbolic execution or abstract interpretation, model checking, and theory improving, or even a combination there to uh, create really, really interesting strategies that all have very, very uh, good strengths. And uh, in fact, many of these strategies are, are so, good, so good that they're worth combining. And this is exactly what we try to do in Autotest. We try to provide a framework where good ideas can be combined, and then basically we get a best of breed uh, framework. Um, once you start doing that, so you, you put together a framework that can execute tests, and you experiment with various ways to, to, to do strategies. And I'll tell you about a few that we've implemented. And uh, you put in an oracle. Uh, other, other things also become interesting as soon as you, you, you start to use your library on, on real world code. Things like scheduling. How, how do I uh, uh, find out or to evenly test my, my source code? Test case minimization. If you use really, really uh, tricky uh, and um, abstract uh, technologies, to test your source code, uh, you still want to present the user a very simple bug reproducing example so that he has an easy start starting debugging from where you stop. Um, when you test for a very long time, you want to have the execution robust. I think this has already been mentioned today. It, nothing is worse than you, 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 you test and um, you can't actually see your test results because at some point something happened um, that, that uh, brought your system down. So you want to have robust execution or at least retrieve the results uh, as, as long as you can. And there are many other aspects here uh, that uh, I'll talk a word or two about. Um, so the title says push button testing. Let me clarify what that means in our context. Uh, we really try to have 
a, a system where the user pushes a button uh, and then for code that he just wrote, we can automatically create the input data, uh, run the, uh, the, the actual test cases, and then judge whether there were bugs or not. With one requirement though, and that is the, the software needs to be equipped with contracts with, in, in the form of executable specification. So we're targeting um, Eiffel. I don't know how, how many of you are familiar with, with, with the language. Oh, it's, it's quite, quite a few, so I don't need to talk too much about it. Basically, you have preconditions, postconditions, and invariants. A precondition, well, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see later on anyway. Um, a system such as this can, uh, can be envisioned to be used in several scenarios. For example, the testing over lunch scenario where you use all morning, you, you write new code, and then you go for lunch, but right before you push the button, test gets exercised, and as you come back, you have a, a, a bunch of bug reports, and then you're busy all afternoon too, right? Um, you can test overnight, have it on a server, continuous testing has been mentioned several times. You can either do it in the background of your IDE or you have a separate testing server that uh, is integrated with your continuous build infrastructure, things like that. Uh, a, a central part of why we can fully automate our testing is uh, the executable specification. In actual, it's called uh, design by contract. Let me give you a quick refresher on, on how this works here in the form of a square root function. So it's a function that computes the real square root of a real input variable. And what you have here is a required keyword and then the predicate, the implementation which I omitted here for brevity, and you have the ensure keyword which basically gives you the post condition. Um, now, the contract that is established here between somebody using a client of this, of this method and the method itself is the following. Uh, the client has to establish the precondition, and only then is the method itself obliged to satisfy the post condition. And uh, it's by definition that if the precondition is not satisfied, uh, the implementation can do wh whatever it, it thinks. It can uh, return erroneous things, it cannot return null, it can go for copy, wh whatever, whatever it thinks um, is, is nice. Um, now, this is applicable uh, whenever you have a language that supports contracts. Natively, namely the Eiffel language, or more recently, Microsoft has developed a language called SpecSharp, which is essentially C Sharp uh, with, with those contracts. But you can also apply it to languages where you introduce those contracts as extensions. For example, there's a set of um, extensions for Java, like JML, OCL, this tool, I think, JContract, iContract. And, and many more of these. Uh, and of course, you can also just provide them manually using things like the percolation pattern. Okay. Um, so, to conclude the section of test automation, let me give you an example of how we think about test automation. Since I'm currently employed in Zurich, Switzerland, I'm required to do those examples only in the domain of uh, the financial world. So I'll have the bank account. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, yeah. That's true. Um, so we have the example here of a bank account. Um, class bank account, then you have the create keyword, which basically says, well, there will be a method with, uh, called make that can act as a constructor. Then you have the constructor itself. But let's before, before, before looking at the constructor, let's look at these two attributes here, they're the main ingredients of the class. You have an owner, which is the name of, of the person holding the account, and you have a balance, which is an integer in, in, in our example. Oops, gone too far. So the integration procedure, you pass a name, it's a string, and uh, then you require that this name is not void because you don't want to have a bank account without an owner. In the implementation, you set owner to receive name, and you set balance to receive the value of zero. And then you have a post condition which ensures that the owner equals the name. Uh, there's also an invariant section down here, which is uh, also a, a part of, of, of the contract. It basically limits uh, the set of objects that we consider valid. Any object that is valid needs to have an owner that is not equal to void and a balance greater or equal to zero. And in fact, with the creation procedure here, we can see that uh, due to the precondition, the post condition, 
uh, the invariant is always guaranteed right after the object is created. Right? Um, and then we have another method that's quite interesting. It's called deposit. You give it an integer, and with this one, you can add money to your account. The implementation is quite straightforward. It basically adds the to uh, the balance, and then the post condition just restates that the new balance equals the old balance plus the value uh, that you've transferred. All right. Now we do have this class. Uh, we have the contracts in there. They are not particularly sophisticated. How can we use that for testing? Let's look at how we would invoke the auditor's testing tool uh, on such a system. Well, first of all, you need to invoke this command line tool, so you type auditor. The next thing is you give it an ACE file. This is basically in Eiffel. Uh, what in C is a make file, or in Java is, is the class file. It basically contains the list of directories that contain the classes that make up your application or library. You would need that to compile the application anyway, and you pass it to the auditor's testing tool completely unmodified, so you don't need any, to do any work there. And then what's left is you specify the testing scope. You probably don't want to test your whole application every time, so you give here a list of classes, and then all of this will concentrate on those two classes only. Now, given, these, uh, given this invocation, um, what could all of this do? Well, it'll start by creating test cases. Let's not go into detail what actual strategies um, are used here. Um, it could start with testing string. In order to do that, it would create an object of type string. So it would say create here, and then the type name in curly braces, and then a variable name that receives the newly created object. And then it would call some methods on it. It will call that wipeout. Well, the wipeout would be a method on, on string that removes all the characters. Now, we know that when we create a new string, it's empty. So it's probably not the most smart idea to call wipeout here. But actually, it's a border case, and it might reveal a, a bug. And actually, it might just indicate that the strategy that we use to generate the test cases is based on randomness. As the next step, it call, could use the same object to call uh, append character. It, it, it would be a method that would append one character to the end of the string. And then it could call append double, which is the same thing for um, double values. Then it could, for example, create a new string and put it into a variable called b2. Then it could call b1 append string b2. So it would append whatever is in b2 to the end of b1. Again, probably not very clever because there's nothing in b2. Uh, and then it could call fill, which basically takes the character you supply and fills up the string with uh, a lot of g's here in this case. Um, and then it could go on to test string. And eventually, if it's bored, it continues with testing class bank account is the second class here in the test scope. Um, so what happens first, again, same structure. It will create a, an object of type bank account, store it in variable three. You can see here that the constructor needs uh, an argument. It's the owner name, if you remember correctly. And uh, our strategy decides to use v2 here. If we go back here, v2 was created with type string. That's OK. And then it starts using methods from bank account. There are not many available. Deposit is here, so it'll deposit 15, um, um, well, Swiss francs, for example, Switzerland again. Then it'll deposit 100 francs, and then it decides to use a negative integer, and it'll deposit minus 8,901 francs. All right. Um, so how can, in, in, in such a scenario, how can we detect bugs? Uh, does anybody have an idea? Can a bug here detected, be detected in the script? Yes? Exactly. So to repeat what, what, what you've just said is that what will end up here is a negative, a ne negative balance. And when we look back at the invariant of the class, it states clearly the balance must always be greater or equal to 0. And now those contracts are always checked at runtime. The invariant is always checked at the routine entrance and the routine e exit in, in Eiffel. Um, so if the script is executed, uh, we'll get an error here. And even more so, we can even put blame. We can say, well, it's clearly, uh, it's clearly the fault of deposit. 
because it left the, the it, before it did something, the state was good, and after it did something, the state was bad. Okay, um, so uh, the script to reproduce this clock can be very long. So it's a few lines here, but you see the ellipsis uh, marked here. It could be a few thousand lines long. It could have gone on to do other things in the meanwhile. Um, it's probably not the best to give the user this very, very long script and ask him, well, please work from here. So what you want to do in this scenario is you want to extract uh, a smaller test case. And when you look at it, actually, these three lines that are marked red now, it's not really red in the projector. Um, it's red here in my notebook, though. Um, represent the smallest test case that will still reproduce the exact same problem. Right? Um, so this is uh, another thing you, you probably need to take care of when you're trying to do test automation in this way. Um, another thing you, you might want to take care of is, again, this robust execution thing, where when you're doing interesting or <laughs> dangerous things here in the middle, you might want to recover gracefully from it uh, and, and, and not, not just stop. So the idea here, actually, another idea that's in this example is that uh, to test bank account, we're not creating a new argument. We're using one from previously. Of course, we could have used just a, a, a new one as well. Uh, some of our strategies that we've implemented, though, uh, sometimes decide uh, intentionally to use an older object because it might have been used before and brought into interesting states because it's been used with other methods before. So we hope to get a more diverse set of test cases this way. Um, so we have this framework idea. Uh, we want to have uh, an automated testing framework like, like I just sketched, where we have the actual testing strategies that are pluggable. You can replace them. Uh, we want to have the flexible execution mechanisms, ex uh, mechanism because we don't know exactly how the strategies are looking, looking like, or they're just very, very uh, different by nature. So the execution mechanism needs to support them all, or as many as possible of them. Uh, you want to be robust, I just said that. Um, one of the benefits of, ha of having such a framework is that have, you have a unified interface for, for the user, and you always ensure um, that you stay push button because the, the user interface of the tool uh, enforces it. You always just give it the system and the scope. Um, this kind of test case, full test case automation, I don't think it's going to replace manual unit tests uh, anytime soon. I think it should cooperate with manual unit tests. These kinds of automated unit tests are very good at some parts, uh, at some tests. Humans are, are uh, good at others, and I think they really, there's a complementary nature. So I think it's important to have such a framework integrate tightly with the existing many unit test cases. And also, as I briefly mentioned, you want to have concise input, no matter how complicated the inner workings of your system are. Um, so the testing focus <coughs> of our auto test framework lies in the in, so many, many people think of different things when they talk about testing. This is a very, uh, it, it's, it's of course trying to classify where we try to put, put the focus. I think auto test can, can be very well situated in the, in the vicinity of unit tests and integration tests. It's very not as good as system tests, uh, at system tests because they require very, very complicated uh, input that uh, automated strategies might not always be able to satisfy. And it, it's not, it, it doesn't accept the test, testing at all because, um, yeah, we don't have the corresponding requirements to process automatically. On the other hand, uh, if you do have created unit tests or integration tests that reveal the bug due to integration with manual unit testing, you basically can feed back uh, an extracted form, an extracted witness of the automatically generated tests. Uh, to your regression test you to be executed next time around. So if you have, for example, an automatic strategy, you're, you'll be sure that this interesting case, because it revealed the problem, will be executed next time around, and not only has a chance to be executed next time around. All right, uh, this brings me to the uh, 
a section with the core components, namely the oracle that we've implemented and the strategies that we've implemented or are working on. Um, so the oracle that we use is based on those contracts that I've introduced before. If you have, once you have the notion of preconditions and postconditions, and somebody gives you a method um, that you've never heard before, you can basically call the method with arbitrary arguments, with ar arbitrary parameters, and then you hope for two things. The first thing is you hope that the precondition will not be violated, because per definition, if it's violated, uh, anything the method does uh, is, is okay. Only if it's not violated, the method is obliged to satisfy the post condition. So you hope, if you're looking for bugs, you hope that the post condition will be violated. Because exactly in this scenario, you've revealed the bug and you know who's to blame. Um, in practice, things are a little more dif di uh, difficult because, as you've seen in the example before, there are also invariants and they can reveal bugs. Uh, sometimes a precondition can signify a bug. Imagine the situation where you have a method in your test, you call it, you satisfy its precondition, but this method in turn calls another method or itself recursively violating the precondition of the second method. Then clearly there's a bug in the first method. So precondition can mean you have to reveal the bug, and your oracle needs to take care of that. Uh, you have a search statements, and they're actually called check, uh, check instructions. Uh, those re reveal bugs too. And you have other kinds of exceptions. Think of uh, uh, a null point of the reference and things like that. Um, so this is basically the oracle that we have in place. Now I'll uh, introduce very briefly five uh, strategies that are either already um, um, ready for, for, for use or which we're still working on. The first of these uh, strategies is the random uh, testing strategy. It's the first one that we've implemented because it's rather simple. Uh, as it turns out, it was also very effective. You're going to see some experimental results that we have later on. So to explain it, for each method in your test, um, we create a target object and then we put it in a pool. This pool is basically this V1 and V2 that you've seen before. And we keep this pool around, not only for one test case, but we keep it as long as possible in order to get as diverse objects as possible. Um, I'm doing something to the microphone, I think. Um, <laughs> and the next step for each parameter of the method you want to call, you're also going to create an object and you put it in the pool. And then, in order uh, to have objects uh, in different states, you pick one object from the pool and you call an arbitrary method, not necessarily one from the, from the methods in your test on it, just in the hope to get a little more diversity there. And only after this step, you take again the method in your test, you pick now, for every blank there is target object and parameters, you pick a conforming object from the pool, not necessarily the one uh, that you've created with intention to create tests, but an arbitrary one to test. So sometimes you get just a newly created one, which is an initial state, and sometimes you get an older one. Maybe it's the line here. Okay. Um, you invoke the method in your test, and uh, you <laughs> you hope to reveal bugs. Okay. <laughs> I think that fixed it. And then there's a follow-up strategy to this one that we're currently working on, which is based on the idea of adaptive random testing. Uh, adaptive random testing can be best explained using uh, objects that are in the two-dimensional domain. For example, if you've already several objects to choose from when <coughs> testing, like depicted here, those uh, empty circles, then the first time around, you're going to pick an arbitrary. Now the one that we, we pick arbitrarily is marked with blue. And then the second time around, uh, the idea is to not use a value very similar to the one you've already picked. So in order to pick one that is rather different, you're going to measure the distance to all the other input candidate objects. And then you're going to choose the one with the largest distance. <coughs> and then you also mark it. 
And in the next turn, the third round of testing, you're going to calculate the distance from each point uh, in the candidate input set to all objects that you've already used. And the one with the biggest average distance, you're going to choose next. And then you continue like this. Um, and the strategy that we're developing in, in, in search for this has uh, does this not only for objects in the two-dimensional domain, but we can actually uh, do this for, or will be able to do this for arbitrary objects, compound or not. Um, another strategy, another experimental strategy that we have is based on, an, uh, on a planner as they use them in the domain of artificial intelligence. Those planners are typically used to guide robots through mazes, so they have a description of their maze, the world, uh, some actions that they can uh, take in this maze, and then they have an initial state, which basically is the co coordinate where the robot starts out, and then they have goal states, which is a set of places where the robot should end up in. And then they ask the planning system, and uh, the, the planning system gives you a plan, which is basically a sequence of actions, in uh, the simplest case, uh, that when executed on the robot, will get the robot from its initial position to a goal position. Now we've transferred this model to software testing, and we've said, well, we describe the software system as the world. The initial state is where no object is created at all. The goal state is any state where there is at least one object with uh, corresponding parameters that satisfy uh, the method under test. And then you give this to the planning system, and you end up with a sequence of instructions, which basically is already your test case. And this can be used to satisfy preconditions that are tough to satisfy randomly. Uh, this strategy presented us with a few challenges because the contracts that we find in practice and we tested on real world software um, is they are not perfect. They don't look like your JML textbooks examples. So uh, what we needed to augment this with was a learning process. We had the planning strategy come up with uh, not the ideal plan, because it turned out that was not feasible, but with some plan. And then as we were executing the plan, um, we learned about misconceptions we had about the world, um, that is the software system. And then during the execution, we replanned to make up for these mistakes. Uh, and this, in turn, was one of the motivators where we said we really need uh, a flexible execution, execution mechanism where execution and, and, and uh, test case creation can be interleaved uh, seamlessly. And then uh, there's another uh, strategy that we're still working on, which is based on forward testing. Now, the planner-based strategy, the thinking of the planner uh, internally acts backwards. So you start the planner internally in its, its mental mode, puts, it, puts himself in the goal state, and then goes backwards in each step. And as soon as it reaches initial state, it uh, shows you the plan. In forward testing, we do uh, the reverse thing only without the planner. We start with uh, newly created objects, and then we move forward, only not only in a planning uh, mode, but in, in, in real life. And as soon as we uh, think that our abstraction of the state, um, we've already seen it, then we'll restart with the new sequence. And uh, the last strategy that we also have already fully implemented for the auto test uh, framework is the <laughs> It's an interesting one because it's an automated strategy to support manual unit test cases. So with manual unit test cases, um, uh, I, I mean your regular X unit kind style test cases. Um, in order to stay true to the original I idea of push button testing, there were a few things though that we needed to do. You, the way you can use it now is that you put your manual unit test cases into your system um, that you're compiling to build your application. And then the automated tester will detect the, uh, all manual unit test cases simply by the fact that they all inherit from this test case class. Um, and then in the next step, we still want the user not to tell the system what test cases to execute. We still want him just to give the test scope. And we, want, uh, we want the user to say, well, I have changed this class. Please test it. We don't want to tell, tell, uh, let the user tell auto test what test cases it needs to use. So auto test, the manual <coughs> testing strategy uh, takes not only the inheritance relation, but also the association uh, uh, relation to find relevant test cases. It basically goes through the list of test cases 
and looks what uh, types do they exercise. And if the type that they exercise is in the test scope, it marks it as relevant. And then before it does any automated, uh, truly automated test case generation, it executes the set of relevant test cases. Um, now this, this um, strategy is important because it closes the loop once an automated, it not only supports the existing manager unit test, but it also closes the loop that if an automated strategy uh, reveals a bug in the form of a script, you can uh, downsize the script to a reasonable size and then convert it to a manual unit test, put it in the system, and the next time around, it'll be run as part of the manual unit test integration with, with no extra magic. And uh, for our implementation, we're actually we're able to reuse the oracle that we've implemented uh, un unmodified for a manual unit test. All right, so much for the core components that were the oracle, how do I test whether a test is passed, do I verify whether a test is passed or fail, and the strategies that actually come up with the input data and the test case itself. And now we'll move on to the uh, supporting components um, that we found necessary. So I start with uh, a picture that will coarsely show you the architecture of the auto test framework. Um, I'm not going into too much detail here. We're going to see this picture again a bit later on. The important thing for now is this dividing line here. You see that we have a master and an interpreter. Um, the, the, the purpose of the separation is, is uh, to have robust testing. The master process is the brains. It knows uh, what to test. It knows, or it at least thinks it knows, uh, in what order to test things, what arguments with. It knows everything. The only thing it doesn't know is actually how to exercise, how to execute the system or test. Only the interpreter, the, the slave or the, the muscles, know this. So basically it communicates, and in the auto test framework it just communicates via standard input, standard output channels, uh, requests to execution, and then the interpreter does that and responds back. What we get here is the brains that knows what it wants to do and what it did already, even in the case of a disaster in the interpreter, is able to recover gracefully. Uh, we're going to see that on the next slide a little bit in, in, in more detail. Another advantage is that for the random based uh, strategies, we can keep objects around for longer because we don't have this uh, notion of run a single test case thought and run another one. It's all one seamless test case in the end. And it also uh, allows uh, this direct execution of instruction for instruction this seamless integration uh, or interleaving between uh, test case creation and execution like the planning strategy needs. Um, so here we see a scenario of how the test driver, the master, communicates with the interpreter. In the beginning, the, the test driver starts off with the interpreter and uh, initializes it. And then it sends a request to invoke a method which interpreter will do, and then it responds back with a status message, which is basically either yes, the message completed successfully, here's the output, or no, it triggered an exception, here are the details about the exception. Everything is fine. The test driver uh, records this information and goes on with the next uh, invocation request. It does that, and now in this scenario, at this point, the fatal error happens. Either uh, the interpreter is shut down completely, um, or it, it, it it uh, goes into a state from which it cannot recover anymore. Um, now, the test driver in such a case will wait for a certain timeout and then assume that the interpreter is of no, no use anymore. It will stop the interpreter and start a new one. And then uh, the first few times it will probably try to test the method uh, that just um, uh, did horrible things again, and if these things happen repeatedly, eventually it will move on to the next method. The important thing is that all the information from the test, uh, testing groups out so far are still there. Uh, when we first experimented with the random strategy, we had a model where we first created a set of objects in, in the pool, and then we did a lot of diversification the, in, in the sense of method calls. And we found that before we came to the actual testing, already we would each time 
uh, kill the, the testing process, and we'll ne we'd never any get any results. Um, using a setup like this, we can uh, we can get results in any case. So now let's come back to the architecture picture here. You have two inputs. It's the same thing as before. The system under test. It's basically the ASD, which all of this parses here. Then you get the test scope in the set in the sense of the set of classes that you want to emphasize testing on. And uh, the system under test is passed to the strategy. The test scope is passed to the uh, strategy. And uh, the system under test is also passed to the interpreter because this one is actually the one executing it, so it needs to know about it too. Now, inside of the master process, there are a few other interesting components. This is strategy, uh, or, or several strategies that are replaceable that look at the system under test and then decide how to test. They forward the request to the proxy because you don't want to serialize and parse the answers from the interpreter all the time. Instead, this is outsourced to a separate component. And then the proxy returns the result if asked for by the strategy and also to the Oracle, which then judges what just happened is either a bug or not, and then generates the results accordingly. All right. Um, so again, here would be the invocation of the auditor's tool. You start out with the command line uh, tool. You give it um, the assembling description, the compilation file, and then you tell it what to test from the system that is described in the assembling file. Um, if, you, if you do this in, in practice, and if you give it a list of many classes, um, you, you'll start to wonder in what order to test them. And uh, so what we've done for auto test is also not just please execute 10,000 10, tests, but instead please test for 30 minutes or 24 hours. Because, for example, if you want to test over lunch, you're not exactly sure about before how long 10,000 tests were going to take, but you know that you'll be back, I don't know, half past one. Um, so you give it a timeout. And then we've <laughs> implemented a scheduler here um, that basically uh, fairly distributes the testing exercising uh, on all the methods in your test using um, a very simple scheme. So you assign every method a, a, a static priority. The higher the priority, the more often it will be tested. So here, for example, we would have bank account deposit with a static priority of two, and we would have string fill with a static priority of one, and string wipe out with a static priority of one. Uh, by, default, by default, all methods from all classes get the same priority that you've mentioned in the test scope. And then, in the first step, you, you assign, there's another concept, dynamic priority. In the first step, you just set the dynamic priority to the corresponding static priority. And then you have a priority queue, which always gives you the method with the highest dynamic priority, and you use exactly that one uh, to create the next test case for it. And once you've done that, you decrease its dynamic priority. In the case uh, of the example here, things would go this way. And once you've reached a state where everything is zero, well, you just reset. And unless your static priorities are very high, so that executing them one time will take longer than uh, the whole testing session, this will uh, guarantee some kind of fairness. All right. so. What happens when we do find bugs? Um, in order to facilitate long time testing, we've tried to do as little things during testing as possible and to do everything that can we, we can outsource uh, afterwards to actually outsource afterwards. The idea would be to be able to test, to, to, do, to not increase memory as we go so we can extend the time of testing. Uh, because of this, um, what we do during testing is we just log all the communication between the master and the slave and we put it in a file and we keep on testing. And the actual uh, judging, the job of the oracle, is done afterward incrementally based just on this log file. Because by, by reading it, you can uh, get all the information that you would have during execution. Um, and now, suppose you found a bug. The script might be very long. The first guess at a uh, bug reproducing example, something you want to give to the user and say, here, look, this is wrong in your software. Please go and fix it. It might be very large. It might be a few thousand lines of code. It might be even longer. 
if, if you've tested for long enough, long enough. So it's important here, in, and in practice, when, when you manually look at the cases, the minimal test cases are typically in the range of three, three to five lines that, that are detected. So they're significantly smaller. So what you do want to do here is you want to minimize your witnesses. Uh, and then from the minimized witness, you create a manual unit test case and you put it back in the system. So how do we do the, with the minimizing? Well, we've, uh, we've applied a technique that's called uh, static program slicing. It's, it's actually very simple. When we look at the example from before, uh, where the deposit would go down the balance to below zero, we said this would be the minimal test case. The slicing we've implemented doesn't detect uh, this test case, but it detects one that is not much bigger. What it does is it starts uh, at, the line of the, at the problematic line, and then it works its way back, backwards. Well, it sees we need we for three to, to, to reproduce this test case, so it marks the previous line because it also deals with V3, and it, this step actually might have been necessary to move V3 into a state so that the uh, bug actually is revealed, and then it goes forward. Well, again, V3, we're interested in that. Of course, we're interested in this line because it creates V3, but there's another important thing we learned here, and that is uh, in order to create V3, we do need V2. So it puts V2 up on its agenda, and it moves backwards and says, well, also V2 here was interesting uh, because it got changed. And then, oops, of course, we need the creation of V2. But everything else, no, is not needed for the test case. Um, and this is our way to, to minimize the, the test cases, and it works quite effectively in practice. Now, it needs to be said that this uh, minimization is not sound, so in some cases it can be that the original test case does reproduce the bug and uh, the minimized version does not. The advantage of the slicing that, uh, that we use is it's very fast. It's very effective because it's very fast. Now, uh, in order to filter out those attempts of minimization that uh, are not, do not reproduce the original bug, we just uh, give the minimized example to the interpreter to run again and see whether the same exception is thrown. Uh, of course, it could be thought of here that if you do recognize a case where minimization was unsound, you employ a longer running, more thorough process to minimize the test case. But that's not, not implemented at the moment. Uh, and actually, we haven't found such a case yet. So um, to sum up the architecture of auto test, we have a scheduler in the form of a priority queue. We have several strategies implemented. The random strategy, um, the adaptive random strategy, uh, a planner-based strategy, you making use of a planner of, of a, a tool from the AI domain, uh, a strategy we call forward testing, and we integrate many unit test cases um, into our set. Then we have an oracle which is based on contracts, it reveals bugs automatically if the source code is equipped with executable specification. <clears throat> and then in the end, we minimize our test cases because they can end up being very, very large. And we have an interpreter that we tweaked so that it provides a, a very flexible vehicle uh, for the strategies to work with. Right, this brings me to the demo. Uh, I haven't mentioned yet Autotest is a release tool. You can get it from this website. It's released in both binary and open source. Uh, well, it's released as open source. You can get the binary or the source code and uh, play with it. It's released in a license that uh, is not BSD without advertising, but it's equivalent, so you can basically do whatever you want with it. Um, all right. So here's the demo. I'm going to invoke it from the command line, similarly to what I've shown you. Uh, in the slide, so this is the name of the tool. I give it the variables option. This is just so that you see what the tool is doing while it's doing it. Then I'm a little cheating here. I'm saying just test. Basically, this skips the step of the interpreter compilation and generation, which I've done before to save time here uh, and be a little briefer. Um, and then I specify a timeout. Uh, I say, please stop after five minutes. And then I give it the system.ace file, which contains the list of, of, of directories that contain the classes I want to test. And then I say, please test class bank account. 
and cast string, and we'll put in a uh, cast link list to the set as well. I'm executing it, it's parsing the system now, and then, wow, well, that's, <laughs> let me just set, I think I forgot to set some environment variables and it's using them, uh, the wrong version of the tool. Let me try this. No? That's interesting. Um, wow. What just happened here? I, I just did this, right? Unfortunately, something is not working here. I can't fix it anymore. You have another export. You mean this one here? Uh -huh. No, no, that, that one shouldn't. Um, I'm just. Yeah. No, I, I'm, I'm really sorry. Um, it, it doesn't buy you anything, but it, it worked uh, this morning when I tried it last. <laughs> uh, phew. Um, well, it, 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 it didn't work. I have the results pre-generated for this case. <laughs> so what it does, it generates a set of HTML files of oh, this word. Okay. Um, so you see the bug statistics here. Um, these were the classes that we've selected for testing. And in these five minutes that we've just, just run the testing tool in, <laughs> We've discovered tests in all three of these classes. In class bank account, you can see the deposit method. And what you see here then is just the already extracted test case. Um, I'll move this a bit over here. <laughs> this uh, is not an Eiffel syntax, but it's, it's really, it really looks just like a manual unit test case. So you can see that it's already minimized to those three lines that create well, actually, the bank account in the example is a little different. It doesn't take a string. It takes a person as a parameter. It creates a person. Then it creates a uh, bank account with the person, and then it deposits a negative amount of money. And you can see from the variable number here, B66 and B67, uh, that this happened actually somewhere down uh, the, the road and has only later been minimized. Uh, in the other classes, we also found some bugs. I can show you results here that look exactly identical. So for example, here we create a new string and then we call it that. And this is actually a bug uh, um, I know of. We've reported this. It, you can look at the exception trace that's also provided here. And you'll see this is a case of a nested precondition violation because the that in, time, in turn calls share. And then we have a precondition violation. Um, in a similar vein, you have a section with many unit tests. So many unit tests were selected um, that the system found are relevant, and we have a few uh, uh, bugs revealed through this as well. And then you have a section called other classes. Since we have a step that we call diversification, uh, methods are called that were not originally meant to be tested. And in some cases, we do find bugs during those method calls because they have precondition and post conditions as well. And then if we do find those bugs, we mark them just as well. Okay, um, let me go back to the slides from this very successful presentation and uh, show you experimental results that we've collected back in, 
in Zurich. So we've, we've run this pool on uh, quite a few libraries here, are a few of those results that we have. Uh, we've run it on Eiffel Base, which is basically the Eiffel standard library. We've run it specifically and uh, with a uh, longer running uh, time on base structure, which is uh, this data structure library from the standard library. <coughs> we've run it in a library called Google Math, which deals with mathematical things. And then we've run it on an application called Dr. C, which parses C declarations and then tries to describe them to you in plain English. Um, and then we've, we've revealed whatever we found here, we did this using the random strategy only. And I'm not going to read the numbers to you, but you, you can see that even though it's just a random strategy, we already uh, revealed uh, quite a few problems here in the source code. Um, all right, so to sum it up, um, I've presented to you the Auditist framework. It's a push button testing uh, tool using contracts, and uh, the actual testing strategies to, that come up, to come up with the, with the test cases are, are pluggable in this, in this framework. We have several strategies already or in the works. Uh, we do find real world uh, wh whenever somebody gets a software to run. Uh, we have robust and flexible execution tool. We try to keep objects around for as long as possible and we think that's a good idea. Uh, we tightly integrate with many unit test cases and uh, we minimize the test cases in the end because we keep objects around for very long time. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Um, are there any questions? Actually, yeah, I have the mic, so I'll go for the first question. Um, if I, I'm just trying to summarize, and, and you know, first of all, thanks a lot for the talk. I think it was very good. But to summarize what the software actually does, does it is it safe to say that it's it's an automatic test case creator by sort of inspecting code um, and given certain constructs of the code, it constructs test cases from it. Is that does that summarize it well? Yes. Okay, so then a follow-up question to that would be, um, have you heard of this software or this company called Agitar that has something very similar, I think? Uh, is there any difference in the style or is, like, what are the differences between Autotest and something like Agitar? Um, so, the, the actual strategies, uh, I, I think, are, are different and uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm not aware how far Ajitar has this framework aspect to actually replace the, 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 the strategies they, they use. So actually, I, that, that part I know. I know that they don't have pluggable strategies, which is something that I saw that your framework has. That's actually good, because one of the drawbacks of uh, Ajitar is, and, and maybe for the folks who don't know, it's, it's basically software that can take in a piece of source code or, or system and agitate the source code to kind of figure out possible cases that can break each line of the code, or in this case, methods. But what they don't have is something that Autotest has, which is pluggable strategies, which is kind of the good thing. Right. But I just want to know in terms of the um, sort of the, 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 the general approach, is there any difference? Or? No, I think, I think it's very similar. And I think there's, there's not only Ajitar, I think many people currently are, are, have done or are working on very interesting um, ways to come up with those test cases. And uh, we want to do that too. But we also want to try to combine uh, good ones and see whether this brings us even forward. Because very often, uh, individual strategies have strengths, very good strengths, but also weaknesses. For example, some work good with structural environments, some work good with uh, reference structures, things like that. Thanks. I think the big difference would be behavioral analysis versus um, static code analysis, really is, is a key difference. Or is they're looking at behavior and how it performs, whereas Agitar is you know, looking at the code and saying, okay, how could I break this? So they're equivalent to a code inspection, whereas this is black box testing. So in, 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 in fact, whether you do, um, to, to refine what you say, in, whether you do black box testing or white box testing, the strategy is free to do either. Andreas, uh, Bob, oh, you remember if I uh, comment about, just a follow-up comment about Agitar is that uh, uh, that strategy, I'm, by the way, full disclosure, I'm on the technical advisory board, so uh, their strategy does not require the uh, presence of uh, preconditions, postconditions, and invariants. Instead, it infers things that are like that by observing the right. execution of runtime behavior true. and uses a collection. My question is, I was intrigued by your uh, minimization. Uh, 
you showed a graph where you said you're basically computing some uh, minimal distances and trying to uh, increase diversity of tests uh, doing that. And then your minimization strategy for uh, uh, slicing. Uh, those two things, I wanted some clarification on that. Are those basically different uh, approaches or are they uh, two sides of the same coin? I think, I think they, they are orthogonal with each other. So the, um, the adaptive random part is concerned with the selection of input during the time where we create this continuous long test case, this long running uh, test case. And uh, afterwards, after execution finished, we take this, this very long test case and uh, reveal bugs by looking when exceptions happen. And then as the first step, uh, we take, um, we, we create a witness from that. It can be very long. Basically, it is from the line where we discovered the bug to the point where we last restarted the, the, the interpreter. And then we take this very large piece of witness and minimize it using stat, uh, uh, static slicing. Does that answer your question? Uh, Paul Raita, Hybrid Graphics. And I would like to know if there's any hope of uh, extending this framework for low-level languages like C. Um, I think I think as long as you support contracts or come up with interesting ways to uh, to find equivalent things automatically, there there is there is nothing uh, wrong with applying this to, to other languages. Like Would you be ready to take the challenge? <laughs> um, so I, I think I think we're busy enough with with the plans we have so far. You uh, mentioned uh, spec sharp early on in the presentation. Has this framework already been extended to encompass that, or is it planned to? No, we're currently just concentrating on that. Okay. Um, I don't understand how you counted the, the number of methods that failed, the number of failures. So like when your deposit method fails from minus one, it will also fail from minus 10, minus yes. 20. So you get lots of false witnesses. The failures can be identical. But the statistics actually showed another uh, graph where we, we've isolated uh, the, the bugs and we showed the number of bugs. Those were less, right? So is that manual? Yeah, that part is manual. Uh, Curtis Bowe, World Foundation again. Right here. <laughs> okay, thank you. So I assume integration with other languages is far more than simply being able to parse how they implement contracts. You actually have to have code written in that language. Um, in order to be able to build this sort of testing framework? Uh, so, sorry, you go, go again? Um, when folks are talking about other languages and contracts in different languages are implemented with a variety of different strategies. So I assume applying something like this would require far more than simply parsing how they implement contracts. You would actually, would you have to implement, like how would you create the objects, for example, in order to be able to you actually have to write out the code in their target language. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Okay. Well, in the language of the interpreter. Um, so if, if you make it so that the interpreter uh, has its own little mini language, this just happens to look very, very similar to it. But you could, of course, make it so that this interpreter actually drives the languages that are reasonably similar. Andreas, thanks very much. It's a really interesting talk now behind you. <laughs> <laughs>